Good evening, everybody. It is so wonderful to be back here. Uh, we're coming to you live, to our friends online, from the Torch Center, uh, from our Musser, Musser Monday class. And tonight, I want to do something different than we've ever done uh, in, this, in this series of Musser Mondays, and that is we want to discuss the 13 principles of faith. Now, where do these 13 principles of faith come from? So first, we have to understand the source, and then we can get into the details of each one. So the first time the 13 principles were divided or assigned as they are was written by the Rambam in a commentary to the Mishnah. And the Rambam later on, it was, it was organized in a different fashion with much more elaboration. But if anyone is familiar with the hymn that's sung in our synagogue, Yigdal, yeah. the Yigdal is those 13 principles of faith. Yes. And we're not going to sing it now, but if we were to sing it, right, so the, if we would sing the Yigdal, uh, the first principle, we'll jump right into the first principle. I just want, I want you to know what the Rambam was first. Who was the Rambam? I'm not, I'm not here to do a history lesson. For that, you can listen to my brothers. You can listen to my brother. He was Maimonides. And you can listen to my brother. has a, a tremendous uh, 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 recording, a tremendous podcast on this. It's available online. And that is uh, about Maimonides, uh, the Rambam, who uh, was uh, 69 years old at the time of his passing at 1204 CE. And um, Rambam was an incredible personality because aside from being such an incredible scholar, he was also a physician. He was the physician for the supreme leader of uh, Egypt. And uh, the tale is told that the the advisors of the of the uh, the premier of Egypt was not they were not very happy that the Rambam had such incredible access to the premier to their leader, so they they waged a a ploy against Maimonides, and they were going to get Maimonides killed. How are they going to do that? So they told the king of Egypt. They said, guess what? Your very, very trusted physician, Rambam, Maimonides, he's trying to poison you. He's trying to poison you. Now, the, 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 the uh, king trusted Maimonides, the Rambam, much more than he trusted his advisors. And he knew that Maimonides was a man of God, and being a man of God, uh, God wouldn't allow him sort of to, to be killed for no reason. So the king uh, came up with a plan that Maimonides should choose his own fate. And what they did was, was they, they put together, a, they put a bowl, and in it they had two papers. One was life and one was death. And the Rambam would pick whichever one. If, oh my if he picked life, it was, he was going to live. And if he was going to pick death, then uh, he was going to die. Because they found them to be sort of guilty in their, you know, it was all set up. It's like, you know, it sounds familiar to what's going on today in current events. But either way, so, so, yeah, so, so what was happening, what happened was, is that Rambam was very suspicious about what was going on. And as he was being called up, and this was done in public, as he was being called up to pick out that piece of paper... <coughs> One of the advisors of the king says, This time we got you. So Rambam knew right away that they must have put two papers in that bowl that said death. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So now he has, from the time he hears that, yeah. <coughs> till the time he gets up there to figure out what he's going to do. Yeah. So he stands up there, takes a piece of paper, puts it in his mouth, and says, Whatever is left, I picked the other one. He ate the piece of paper. Whatever's left. Whatever's left, I picked the other one. What was left was death. Oh, oh, oh. They both were. They both were death. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. So he ate it. So they he ate it. So they were, right. They couldn't. No. Right. Oh. So whatever's left, I picked the other one. And obviously, <laughs> he was able to outsmart them and save his life. But the Rambam was um, a man of great influence. In fact, on the tombstone of Maimonides... It says that me Moshe ad Moshe lo kum ke Moshe from Moses at Mount Sinai till Moses Maimonides there was no one like Moses. 
Maimonides was such an epic personality, was such an incredible character that he he really decided, uh, you know, he wanted to do a commentary in the Torah, but Rashi already did it. Rashi preceded him by one generation. And he saw Rashi did such a perfect job, so he said, I wish I'd just duplicate what Rashi did. I'm going to do something Rashi didn't do. And that's when he wrote, uh, he wrote commentary in the Mishnah, which Rashi also did a little bit. But uh, he also, what he did was, was he started collecting all the conclusions of the discussion of the Talmud. And by that, he came up with what is known as Halacha. We know Halacha? The first one to write and compile Halacha was... The Code of Jewish Law. Was Maimonides. Oh, here we go. Right over here. So, to our friends online, you'll just see this here. In a in a uh, in a sheet, but for all of you here who would like a copy of this, who are live at the class, that's one of the benefits of showing up to class itself, right? <laughs> is is that you can actually get a physical copy. Those of you uh, online, you're welcome to email me at awolbe at torchweb.org, a w o l b e at t o r c h w e b dot o r g, and I'll happily send you a PDF of this file. So if you look at this document. Up here in the orange, we have the two tablets that were given to the Jewish people after we had the awesome revelation at Mount Sinai. It was actually 40 days after Shavuot that we received the physical two tablets. Moses comes down the mountain, and what happens? He breaks them. The golden calf. He goes... He has to organize the, the, the congregation, get him back in shape, and then he goes up for another 40 days, comes back, and this time, God forgives, which is the day of Yom Kippur. And Yom Kippur, we say, Vayomer Hashem Salachti Kedvarecha. The Almighty says, I forgive you as per your request. And now Moses is able to carve out his own two tablets. So that's the two tablets. We have Ten Commandments. One side is the laws between man and God, and one side is the laws between man and man. And the first five commandments, I am Hashem, your God. You shall not have another God before me. You shall not say God's name in vain. Keep the Shabbos. Oh, come on. This is, this is and honor your father and mother. And what's, and what's set, side number two? Thou shall not murder, do not commit adultery. Do not steal, do not be a false witness, and do not covet. You had a question? I want to see how smart you are. Yes. In the I want, it's pressure, because I have online Torah, I have an online audience here. In our Torah, <coughs> the Ten Commandments are mentioned twice. Mm -hmm. Deuteronomy. Mm -hmm. But they're not, they're not, they don't use That's the correct. same words. Mm -hmm. And why is that? Each one to teach us different things. I'll give you a quick example. Once it says, honor your father and mother. And once it says, fear your mother and father. It doesn't only say it differently, different commandment of honor and fear, but it switches father and mother and mother and father. So I'll tell, explain to you very simply why. Because each one is to teach you something else. Honor your father and mother. Naturally, who does a child honor? A mother. The honor goes to the mother naturally. You ever look at a football game, they're about to start the, the, the Super Bowl, right. and they zoom into the quarterback, and he's like, anything you'd like to say right before the game begins? He says, Mom, this is all for you, right? <laughs> you see that every year. Every single Super Bowl, Mom, this is all for you. What happens when we're dealing with fear? Who is the fear for more naturally? The father. So it says, honor your father and mother. The mother, who it's natural, should go second. But when it's talking about fear, because the father is the natural one we fear, right. fear your mother and father. Okay? So now, that's the Ten Commandments. And we can get into the details. But the question is, why is honor your father and mother on the side of the laws between man and God? It should be on the side between man and man. Hmm. Right? Yeah. Say our sages, because... Oh. Parents aren't the only uh, creators of a human being. It's a three-way partnership. The Father, the Mother, and the Almighty, and Hashem. The Father and Mother give the skin, the bones, the, 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 the looks, the, you know, all the different components. But the soul, the engine, 
is given from God. The character is given by God. So that's why if you disrespect a parent, you're really disrespecting God. You're disrespecting the whole bond, the whole relationship of creation. Okay, so now we have the green part. The green part is what we call the written law. This is what was given over to the Jewish people in Mount Sinai and then by the, by the, by the prophets uh, after Moses passed away, which is Joshua and Samuel and prophet and, 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 and prophet and, and sorry and judges and kings and so on and so forth. We have over here the whole list of all the 24 books of the written law, of which the first five of the five books of Moses. And this is not negotiable. Right? This was given, the Torah was given by the word of Hashem through the hand of Moses. And the rest was given through the hands of the prophets. And these are the 24 books of the written law. What's the oral law? The oral law is what was written down throughout the generations, notes that explain the written law. We know this as a rule. The written law, the Torah tells us what to do. The Torah tells us what to do. The oral law tells us how to do. There's no mitzvah that you can observe from the Torah without having the oral law attached to it. None. You must have the oral law in order to understand the written law. So it's very important to understand that the Mishnah, the Talmud, both Talmuds, of the, the Jerusalemite Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud, are critical to understanding the Torah. It's very nice that you can read uh, the, the verse in the Torah which says you shall put on tzitzit, but it doesn't say what tzitzit are. It's very nice that you can read in the Torah that it says that you should put a mezuzah in your door. It doesn't say what a mezuzah is. It's very nice that you can read in the Torah that you have to slaughter an animal. It doesn't say how to slaughter the animal. And so on and so forth. I can give you hundreds and hundreds, 613 of them to be specific, uh, of commandments that we have no idea how to observe without the explanation that's given. In fact, there's no word to fill in in the Torah. It's only called totafot. What are totafot? I have no idea. It's a, we all know that there's a commandment to give an eighth day, a boy on the eighth day. What do we do? So, circumcision. Does it say what to circumcise? No. It uses a term for what to circumcise on an organ that has no name like that. So how do we know what organ should be circumcised? Maybe it's the tip of the Jewish nose. We have big noses. Maybe it's to shorten it a little. Maybe. Maybe it's the earlobe. Maybe it's something else. How do we know what it means? Well, we need the oral law to explain it to us. The Torah, if you just look at the words of the written Torah, there's no way for us to understand what the oral Torah explains to us very, very clearly. So now it's very, very important though because the Mishnah is written in code. It's taking all of the writings and the explanations of the oral transmissions that went along with the Torah and put it into the six different categories of the Mishnah. We have seeds, we have holidays, we have women, damages, holiness, purity. These are the six categories of the Mishnah. And each category of the Mishnah is written in a way that's really, well, let's say we need some proof to verify its sources. Okay? Now, wh why was it written like that? They could have just written it straight out for us. Well, the Talmud is engaging us in a conversation, in a discussion of a dispute. Where it's not so simple for you to just give a statement in the Mishnah without proof. So what the Talmud needs to do is see how the Mishnah is backed up in the Torah. Okay, so now the Mishnah tells us, so we have gave, given this example a hundred times, the Mishnah tells us, this is the first Mishnah, from when do we recite Shema in the evening? All familiar? We're all familiar, right? Everyone, everyone familiar with this Mishnah? From when do we recite Shema in the evening? Okay. What's the obvious question that the Talmud's going to immediately attack on this? 
What are you talking about? Who said we say Shema in the evening? You're making an assumption, right? <coughs> well, it's like me going over to Scott and asking him, Scott, when are we going to Cancun? And he's like, uh, I didn't know we're going to Cancun. Right? It's an assumption. You're making a wild assumption. It's the same wild assumption that the Mishnah is making. From when do you recite Shema in the evening? Who even said you say the Shema? And that's what the Talmud begins with. When the Talmud explains that Mishnah and starts to dissect that Mishnah, the first thing that the Talmud does is say, Who, what, where, when? What are you talking about? Who even said you say the Shema? Oh, 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 I forgot to say this. Not that the Mishnah forgot. Of course the Mishnah didn't forget. Mishnah wanted us to learn it so that we can get smarter and really know the Torah. So the Mishnah says, so the Talmud now says, Oh, there's a verse in the Torah. And the verse in the Torah says that you should say Shema in the evening. Ah, now I got it. In the evening and in the morning. When you lay down and when you arise. From here we know that we say Shema both in the morning and in the evening. Oh, okay, now we can start with the discussion of when exactly begins nightfall and when begins morning. And we can, we can have this discussion. So the Mishnah makes the assumption. The Talmud has to prove and verify the assumption of the Mishnah. Okay, so now there's a disagreement. We have our Talmud uh, lunch and learn every single Friday. And we see that there's arguments over everything. Every single word that's written in the Talmud, there's an, oh, well, there's another opinion, and the other opinion holds differently. And the, oh, there's another opinion, and the other opinion holds the other way. And it's always going back and forth until the Talmud resol- resolves with, uh, ends with a conclusion. And the conclusion is the way we actually operate. That's the way we actually conduct ourselves according to the conclusion of that discussion. And that's where Rambam comes in. Rambam studied all of the Talmud, all of the Mishnah, all of the Torah, and came up with all of the conclusions of the Talmud and divided it into 14 different categories. 14 different categories. Anybody know the name of Rambam's book? Mishnah Mishnah Torah. Torah. It's also called? The Perplexed. No, that's a different book. The guide, guide, guide for the Perplex, that's true. That's another, that's another book. But the, the Mishnah Torah, what does it literally mean? What is the words Mishnah Torah? It means review of the Torah. And Maimonides himself wrote about the book Mishnah Torah that anyone who, knows, who learns the Mishnah Torah doesn't need to learn anything else because you got it all. You learn the Mishnah Torah, you got all of the Talmud, all of the Mishnah, all of the Torah. You got it all. It is. All right, organized in a brilliant way. But Rambam is just the conclusions. He's not giving you all of the discussions. If you don't know how he got to that conclusion, you're going to have to open up a Talmud and the Mishnah and the, and the verse in the Torah that actually supports it. It's probably not that interesting. It's very interesting. The oh, conclusions? Oh, it's amazing. Without the argument? Amazing. Rambam wrote, that's the thing, you look at the Code of American Law and you kill yourself from boredom. Right, it is absolutely the worst book in the world. You'd never want to read that code of, of of law, right? Right. But if you read the code of Jewish law written by Maimonides, by Maimonides, it is absolutely mesmerizing, mesmerizing. How perfect, how concise, how accurate, and how beautifully it is displayed in the works of the Rambam. Mishnah Torah means the review of the Torah. Just like the fifth book of the Torah, the book of De- Devarim, Deuteronomy, is also, in, 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 in according to the names that were given to each of the books, uh, is also called Mishnah Torah, the review of the Torah. Because in Deuteronomy, we have a review of everything that was told to us till that point, even the Ten Commandments. So Rambam wrote his commentary uh, he, he wrote the book of law. Now, book of Jewish, <coughs> code of Jewish law. Now, it's also called the Yad HaChazaka, the strong hand. And Yad, anybody know what Yad is? Yad is a hand, right? The hand. And a hand has how many bones in it? It's got 14 bones. We're going to do this together very quickly. Open up your hands, right? Bend your, bend your, bend your, your, bend it. Here we go, like that. Excellent. Now let's start counting the bones together. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. You have fourteen bones, and that 
the Rambam wrote his book, Yad HaChazakah, the strong hand, meaning the book of Halacha, it's divided up into 14 different sections. 14 different sections, 14 different topics. I'll read them to you. Uh, it's here on the bottom of the sheet. One is Hamada, which is knowledge, which it talks about belief, of God, belief in God, the principles of faith, proper behavior, Torah study, idolatry, repentance. Then the second book is about Ahava, which is love, love of God, prayer, tzitzit, tefillin, and other mitzvot, which demonstrate our love for Hashem. Zmanim, which is times, which includes Shabbat and Jewish holidays. Fourth is Nashim, which is women, marriage, divorce, and fidelity. Kedusha, holiness, sexuality, the laws of Nida, family purity, incest and adultery, conversion and laws of kosher. Number six is Hafla'a, which is separation, which is vows, oaths, Nazarites, and donations to the temple. Zra'im, seeds, agricultural laws, gifts to the poor, priests, tithes, secondary tithes, first fruits, sabbatical year, the Shemitah. Avoda, which is number eight, divine service, laws of the temple in Jerusalem. The Korbanot, the offerings, the laws of the offerings in the temple, accepting those of the whole community. Then we have the Tahara, which is cleanliness, ritual purity. We have Nizikin, injuries, which is criminal and tort law. Kinyan, acquisitions, which is marketplace laws. Mishpatim, which are rights civil law, and then the last is Shoftim, judges, laws relating to legislators, Sanhedrin, kings, judges, Noahides, and the Messianic times. These are the 14 <coughs> different categories covering every area in Judaism, and one of the great brilliance of Rambam was how he decided what goes where in those 14 categories. And there are books and books and books and books and books and more commentary written on understanding Maimonides and this book of Yad HaChazaka, Mishnah Torah, than any other book in all of Jewish literature. It's funny because the Rambam says, oh, just try my simple yeah. book and you'll know it all, right? And there's more commentaries on Rambam's Mishnah Torah than in any other book in the, in the, in, in the world almost. Right? Yes? You need the commentaries on the conclusions because without that, you don't understand. But there's disagreements in what he meant. Did he mean this? Did he mean that? It, it, it's, it's really fascinating and ironic that the Rambam's <laughs> book that he says should be just learn this and you got it all is the most disputed book of all. All right? But either way, Rambam was a, 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 such an amazing gift to the Jewish people. An amazing gift to the Jewish people. Uh, he wrote not only these, the, these uh, works but many other works that are, are, are just in, incredible. Reverend, yes. Excuse me. Why I don't I've never understood why Rambam. I mean, if his name is Maimonides, why is he called Rambam? Okay, Rambam is an acronym mm -hmm. for Rabenu mm -hmm. Moshe Ben Maimon. Oh. Rabenu Moshe Ben Maimon. His name was Moshe, and his father's name was Maimon. Maimonides is like the, the I guess, the uh, uh, Maimon. Maimon, I guess, I don't know what the I-D-E-S is. What did you say was on his tombstone? From Moshe to Moshe, there's no one like Moshe. When I was in Israel last summer, uh, his, his, uh, his uh, cemetery, uh, the cemetery in which he's buried, and his, his actual area of, of burial, um, burial site, was under renovations. And... Um, and uh, we weren't able to go because it was closed, closed to the public. But um, hopefully on my next trip to Israel, I plan to go back to Maimonides' tomb because it's, Maimonides is such a special person. We you know, want to have some merits of praying by his tomb. By his tomb. Yes? It, it sounds kind of egotistical. He didn't write that. Oh. He didn't write that. Oh. The people wrote it about him. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Did they move him from Egypt to? Uh, oh, so there's there's a whole legend about how he got from Egypt to Tiberius. He see he wrote that he wanted to be buried in Tiberius because the Sanhedrin, in the time of Messiah, will reunite in Tiberius. That's where they will get re uh, reconvene, and because Maimonides was a man of halacha of law, he wants to be there. <laughs> so. But he passed away in Egypt. 
legend has it that he, you know they, that time they used to do uh, funerals they used to have the the corpse uh, placed on a donkey and according to legend again legend has it that the donkey uh, ran away from the funeral procession and ran straight to Tiberius where he was buried again there are many different I don't, maybe he was taken there but that's what again legend has it we don't know the exact details of that but he is buried in Tiberius that's, that, that's for sure he did die in Egypt and he did die in Egypt. So how, so how he got there, did, well, let's not get caught up in the details. So, let's, yeah. So, and we have to understand that Maimonides, when he wrote the Mishnah Torah, there are commentaries that if you open up a book of Rambam, you will see that on the top right corner and the top left corner of every open page, is the sources in the Talmud that he took his conclusions from. And if you go to the Talmud, you'll see on the top right and top left corner of every open page, the source in Maimonides. So they're both linking back and forth. But in the Talmud itself, you'll see sources. There's almost not a page in the Talmud that doesn't source itself in the Torah. How do you know this? Oh, it says this in, in, in Samuel. How, how do you know that? It says that in, in Numbers. How do you know that? It says it in Deuteronomy. Everything must be sourced. Now, we mentioned this numerous times recently in our classes, that if you ever hear somebody say, well, all oh, the rabbis just made up these rules. That's a lazy way of saying, I just don't know where it comes from. All right? Because the rabbis aren't authorized to make up anything. And if you walk into any synagogue, and the rabbi tells you, or anybody else tells you, you have to do this, you have to do that, you can say, that's, that's fine, with all respect, I, I respect that, I'm not questioning your, your knowledge, but can you just show it to me? Because I want to be more learned, I want to know. And if they're able to show you the source, then great. If they don't know the source, I'm not saying don't listen to them, because they may be right, but do some research. Look it up. Try to find it. We have right over here in our library, we have... Uh, probably about a thousand books already here. And there's a lot to learn. We have a lot to learn. Just these three shelves are just the, the uh, three and a half shelves are the Schottenstein edition of the Talmud in English. It takes seven and a half years if you study it one folio a day. Yeah, right. mm -hmm. If you do seven folios a day, you'll finish it in one year. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's your choice. Um, but that's a lot. That's a lot. How large is the folio? Well, every folio is different. Oh, okay. Yeah. You got to you got to get to certain tractates. It could be like a very large page of uh, Talmud. They just honored people a couple months ago. Well, so well, well there's going to be exactly. right. We did one here in Houston. That's correct. And there was a program that was started by Torch. Uh, now in its second cycle, so almost 15 years ago. All right, and it's unbelievable. That's right. Some people have been through it twice. That's correct. <laughs> Uh, so, so we have like this. We have the Shulchan Aruch, which was written us several hundred years after the passing of Maimonides, which is the practical application of law to today, not including laws of offerings, not including laws of, of, of sacrifices, uh, not including laws of, of the Kohanic uh, uh, duties in the temple, not including, right, only the laws that are relevant today. And that's called the Shulchan Aruch. And then we have even more modern, the Chafetz Chaim, who passed away in 1934, at the age of 94, who wrote the Mishnah Brura. The Mishnah Brura is a very clear and concise uh, uh, detail of the Shulchan Aruch. It means he takes the words of Shulchan Aruch and puts his, his commentary and explanation to what the Shulchan Aruch writes. Very practical, and so we can have it in one fell swoop. If you look over here, there's a book in the Halacha shelf, and then right smack in the middle, it's called Sha'arei Halacha, um, written by Rabbi Zev Greenwald, and my strong recommendation that if anybody wants to learn Halacha, without getting into all the sources and all the background, that's a great, very concise book in English, right there, Sha'arei Halacha, it's a brown and yellow letters. Um, it's really fantastic, and to our friends online, you can find it either here in the magnificent Levitt Family Library, don't take the books out of the center. <laughs> or, or you can find it online. It's published by Feldheim. 
and uh, and it's really a, a fantastic way to get familiar with the laws of prayer, the laws of blessings, the laws of Shabbat, the laws of kosher. It's just a very brief, very summarized, and very easy to obtain. Yes. Okay. You've probably read all this. Stuff. I didn't read it all. I wish I did. Even if I did, I don't know it all. So there's what to aspire to grow and to learn more. I'm just kind of curious. What do you study every day? I mean, what do you what do you choose? I mean, it's a very good question. I say everybody should learn from the Torah, the written Torah, from the oral Torah, and from the halacha every day. You should learn a little chumash. You should learn a little halacha. You should learn a little Talmud or Mishnah and a little uh, halacha. I will share with you, there is a magnificent series that's been put together, and thanks to uh, David and Susan Marbin, it's been sponsored here at the Torch Center, uh, the Daily Dose of Torah. There's a great series of Daily Dose of Torah, which is 18 minutes. <laughs> you will get in it that week's portion. You will get in a little bit of Musar. You'll get a little bit of prayer. You'll get a little bit of Mishnah, a little bit of Talmud. There, it's, each one is one page. You read it's six, seven pages. You got Torah, Mishnah, Talmud, Halacha, it's prayer. It's, it's, yeah, it's a series, those blue ones over there. And it goes by every portion. It, it'll do Sunday of this week's portion, Monday of this week's portion. And by the time you're done, you will be almost a scholar knowing so much. It's, it's an amazing thing. And if there's any group that's interested, I'll be happy to run a class every day. We've done this in the past. I did one whole cycle of the Daily Dose. I'll be happy to do a conference call. If everyone has the book, we can do it at you know, 18 minutes to 10 at night. And we do for 18 minutes, and you will learn so much in 18 minutes. Or you can do it yourself. You can do it with your spouse. You can do it with a friend. You can do it with, with anyone. You can do it yourself, again. So I recommend to, to immerse ourselves in Torah study in all the different aspects, all the different elements. That's beautifully done. There are three series. So you can do it three different times, all different content. It is the red, the blue, and the green. It is just magnificent. They did not have the red when we were ordering them, and the green wasn't published yet. So now the green and the red, so we're going to hopefully get them for our magnificent Levitt family library very soon. All right, but till then, it's very important to remember that the reason why I created this as, as a pyramid is because I want you to realize that you got to climb up to the top. It's not enough to just think up a halacha or a Jewish law. You have to verify it from a higher source. You go through that discussion, there, right? And that has to be verified even higher in the Torah. If God didn't want it to be, be observed by us, God wouldn't put it in the Torah. I mean, God does. Every single word in the Torah is very, very concise. It's very, very accurate to the last letter, to the last vowel. There's a reason for every letter in the Torah. So, that's the Talmud's job, is to dissect why each letter is there or isn't there. Okay? Now let's get to the principles of Maimonides. But they so, don't have vowels in the Torah. They what? They don't have vowels it, in the Torah. It's intentional why we don't have vowels in the Torah, because that way you can learn it in different ways. You can learn it like this, you can learn it like that, you can learn it all the different ways, you can learn it hundreds of different ways. We know that just on the surface, there are four different depths of understanding to the Torah. Right? We have the pardes. We have the pshat, the regular, simple understanding. We have the remez, which is the hints. What is it hinting to? We have the Jewish things we can learn out of it. And then we have the sod, things that are totally hidden. Totally hidden. And on every portion, that's what the Kabbalah is. Kabbalah is the hidden. People like to go to the Kabbalah because it's like, wow, wow, it's going to wow you all day. But the truth is, we need to really understand what, the, what it really says. If anybody here is looking for an activity... Okay, it's a very important one, and a very important one. Take a Chumash, a Torah, a book of the Torah, and just read it in English from cover to cover. You will be blown away that this is your book, your gift that was given to us by God. It doesn't belong to the synagogues, to the rabbis, to the spiritual, to the holy, to the, to the priests who served in the temple. No, it belongs to you. It's your Torah. Read it. God wrote it for you. Just take it and read it. It's simple English. You have, in, you have the blue, 
copy of Art Scroll. It's the Stone Edition Chomish. Or you can get this one with the Interlinear, which we do every Tuesday night in our class. The Schottenstein Edition Interlinear. It's magnificent. Do you have the Living Torah? I do. Absolutely. We have the I, Living Torah right here. Yeah, I have it. By Rabbi Arya Kaplan. An amazing. We have the greatest wealth of knowledge in the world. Let's, let's, let's enjoy it. Let's enjoy it. The Torah is the greatest bestseller ever in history. Amazon bestseller number one by like a thousand million times, right? Is there such a number? I know my kids say that. <laughs> a thousand million, right? Is... You know what's second? What is second? Um, Atlas Shrug. I'm not familiar <laughs> with what that is. Or maybe Ray Ellie Ray. Wiesel's book. You never know, right? Oh, so, yeah. so either way, yeah. uh, either way, let's let's get into the first principle of faith. Now, could you could you press that in? It's not working. Is it not working? There you go. Thank you. I'm sorry. All right. So here we go. The first principle of faith is I believe with perfect faith that God is the creator and ruler of all things. He alone has made, does make, and will make all things. Let's understand what this is. In Yigdal we say God is the living God and praised. He exists, yet his existence has no time. Let's see what this is. The first principle involves belief in the existence of God. Is there or is there not a God? That's the first principle we need to address. Is there or is there not a God? Yeah, I believe there's a God. But to what extent do I believe there's a God? He created me, he gave me life, but you know, to what degree do I feel like he is actually present right now in my existence? Involved in my daily affairs. Involved in everything that happens around me. A little bit more difficult than just theoretically believing in a God. That's what we're trying to immer- immerse our, our well-being in. Our, our existence. Immersing it into the recognition that Hashem, our Creator didn't only create the world, but he exists today. All right? So, the first principle involves belief in the existence of God. There is a being, perfect in every possible way, who is, who is the ultimate cause of all existence. So God is the creator of everything. Can we believe in, in uh, evolution? No. Well, perhaps we can. But don't forget that the first creation had to be created by someone. (coughs) So perhaps God created a world that started from a mustard-sized seed, like Ramban says, and continues to expand. By the way, how does does this whole idea of the Big Bang Theory come from? Where does it come from? TV show? No, not the TV show, right? (laughs) Right. From... uh... From, what's his name, Stephen... Uh, Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking. No, his name doesn't even deserve to be mentioned in a Torah class. Indeed. Right? Indeed. But, but the idea is, where do they come from? Because the universe is constantly expanding. So what they did is reverse. If it's expanding at this and this rate, if you reverse it, how long will it take to get back to an original point of nothing? Okay? Well... That's how they get up to the number of 13 billion years or 25 billion. Everyone give you a different opinion. But let's say it's 13 billion. What's not being counted and what we Jews count, we don't count the crea- from creation of the world. Mm-hmm. We count from the creation of Adam. Right. Okay, it's like they, the, when, the, when, does, when do you start, the, you, you, you turn the clock on, you put that battery in, ah, oh, now the battery, now it starts ticking. Mm-hmm. Tick, tick, tick. It was a clock six months ago. But it went through the manufacturing plant in China. Right, but there was no battery inside. God created the world for Adam. God didn't create the world for the world. God created a world for Adam. So till Adam existed, or was, sorry, till Adam was created by Hashem, there is no time that's relevant. Aside from the fact 
that God didn't create the sun and the moon to serve as ruler over the day, ruler over the night, the sun and the moon, in a cycle of a 24-hour shift till the fourth day. So what happened the first four days? Well, each day doesn't, is not assigned to a 24-hour period. Each day could be a million years, two million years, 13 million years. There's no time. So from the moment of creation till the time the sun and the moon get to a 24-hour cycle could be an untold amount of years because there's no limit to time. There's no reference to time as being a 24-hour period. But who created that first existence? There had to be a creator. It's like it's the equivalent of me telling you, you walk in here and you're like, wow, this is beautiful. Wow, look at the carpets and the chairs and the tables and the beautiful library. These books, it's amazing. You know what I'm going to tell you? Oh, you will not believe this. Someone came here and they dropped off this bag and there was a huge explosion, <laughs> right? And then we had chairs and tables and carpets and paint and the clock on the wall and every. That's the equivalent of saying that a creation of, of, of existence came from an explosion. Right? It doesn't make any sense. So, obviously, you know that if you walk into a room which is so organized with beautiful carpets and chairs and tables, I'm just saying that to entice our friends online to come into this torch center. Right? And, and this, right? It doesn't just come from an explosion. It comes because there's a design. And someone crafted this design. And someone worked to, to assemble these tables and chairs. And it comes with a work, with a, with a vision. God had a vision for the creation of this world. That was the creation of the six days. That first existence is God. Right? God who is the ultimate cause of all existence. All existence depends on Him and is derived from Him. There is nothing in this world that can exist without God. If God doesn't exist, nothing else exists. By definition. So we can't take God out of the world. We can't exist for a moment without God. It is inconceivable that He does not exist. If He did not exist, everything else would also cease to exist, and nothing would remain. If, however, we could imagine that nothing, is, nothing else existed, God still would not cease to exist. That means God's existence does not have anything to do with the existence of the world. Right. If there isn't a world, God still exists. Right. He would not be diminished, diminished in any way. Only God is totally self-sufficient and therefore unity and mastery belongs only to Him. Okay, so we, well, let's understand what this means. Because there isn't an ability for anything in the world to exist without God, only God is the source of all existence. Therefore, God, who is only, right, the only being that is self-sufficient, because everybody else is not self-sufficient. They're reliant on the Almighty. So God Himself is unity, because unity means I don't need anything else for my oneness. God doesn't need anything else for His oneness. That's why it's Hashem Echad. We say Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. We are not Echad. Why are we not Echad? We're not one. Even though you're one of a kind. But you're not one. Why not? Because you still need God to exist. So already you're being assisted in your existence by God. So you can't, you're not one. Because you're relying on a creator. God doesn't need God doesn't have a creator. God is everything. God doesn't rely on any other existence. So God is the master of the universe because again, he doesn't need anything. Everything needs God. Additionally, God is all unity. God doesn't need anything to help him exist. He is everything that he needs in himself and does not need anything else at all. God doesn't... Someone asked me over Shabbat, can God create a stone 
that he can't pick up? It's a stupid question. But people get caught up in this. Well, if you tell me that God can't pick up a stone, can't create a stone that he can't pick up, you see God is limited. If God could create a stone that he can't pick up, you see God is limited. Because he can't do something. Well, God can't catch a cold. God can't get the flu. God can't either get a mosquito bite. Right? God, you know, there's, so God is limited. No, God is not limited. God can't be limited, which is why he can't limit himself. Creating something he can't pick up is limiting. He can't be limited. Okay? It's, really, the question really doesn't make sense. But it it, like it, or when someone asked that question? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's, it's fine. It's uh, people who are seeking to know real knowledge. <laughs> we use it as a tool to get them to learn some Torah. Right? Everything else, however, whether it be an angel, a star, or anything associated with them above or below, all depend on him for their very existence. It says that not a blade of grass grows without the Almighty saying, without an angel <coughs> sent by God saying, grow. <coughs> the most fascinating thing is when my, uh, my children come, from, come home from school, this happens uh, usually by Tu B'Shvat time and by Shavuot time, they come home with a cup. And in the cup is a bunch of little uh, uh, dirt. Right? So you think it's some project. Well, it is. If you water it properly then you'll start seeing buds grow. And it's really beautiful. It's really, it's an amazing thing. The problem is that kids sometimes don't have patience, so they fill the whole cup up with water, hoping it's good, and then they just, they just drown it and, it, and it never grows. But if you teach them to be very patient and to give it a little spray and a little uh, what, nurturing of what it needs, then what happens is, is it, it grows a beautiful little bud. And what's an amazing thing, here they put in a seed... They covered it with sand. They gave it a little bit of water. And then what comes out? A beautiful green leaf. And then you like give it a little bit more water. And the leaf continues to grow. And a whole existence, a whole world gets developed from what? From right? It's from one little seed. It's amazing. You know the problem with Apple computers? If you buried the Apple computer in the ground, you won't grow an apple tree. <laughs> But if you take a rotten apple and put it in the ground, you'll have an apple tree. And that apple tree has the future of all apple trees built into it. Tell me that's evolution. So, Tell me that's a big bang. Yes. So my uncle could be a sponge. Is, your, is his name Bob? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we all could be related to Spider-Man. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it, there's a question, because something you said before. I could be wrong, but I think I read somewhere we're in a galaxy. There are trillions of galaxies, trillions and trillions, is what I've read somewhere. Why did Hashem do that? That, what do they say? I understand why he built the earth, like you say, for Adam, but why did he build these trillions of galaxies? It's a very good question. It's a very good question. I think our job, our primary job, is to figure out why we're here first. Once we figure out why we're here, and we know, and that's obviously why we have these Muster classes, once we can figure that out, then we can go on to the next step of trying to figure out why the galaxies are here and why the sun and the moon are here and why all of the other you know, amazing creations of Hashem are here. There's something to learn from it. I would recommend coming back here to the Torch Center on Thursday at 12.30 when Rabbi Cohen does his Kabbalah class and bombard him with questions. <laughs> yes? Well, you know, it's really pretty simple in that evolution is, is, is phony. Because if, if man evolved from the ape, right, uh, that's an insult to the ape. That's right. That's right. It's a good point right there. So w everything in the entire existence depends on Hashem. The Torah teaches us this first principle. So Rambam derives this first principle. He, he has no right 
to start giving us the principles of the Torah, unless, like we mentioned earlier, Rambam has it sourced all the way up to the Torah. Where does Rambam get this from? Where does he get this from? He's giving us a principle of our faith. Where does he get it from? Exodus 20, verse 2, says the following, I am Hashem, your God. That's where he derives it from. So, Rambam writes the following, The ultimate foundation and pillar of wisdom is the realization that there is a first being who brought everything else into existence. Obvious. Common sense. It should be common sense. Not so common anymore. Uncommon sense today. Uh, right? Just like you cannot have order in this room without a designer deciding where a table should go, where a chair should go, what type of floor, how the carpet should be laid out, what color the wall should be, and so on and so forth, you can't have a world. It is impossible. Go into a grocery store. Look at the fruits and vegetables. Look at the beautiful flavors, the, the, the scents that they have. Look at the, the colors that they have. Look at the tastes that they have. And tell me, this is happenstance. This God has no hand in it. This is just random. Right? It doesn't make any sense at all. No thinking person can come up with that conclusion after recognizing what we have available and ready in a grocery store. And yet when you cut each one up, you find an entire future of all of its grandchildren and great, 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 great grandchildren right there inside each apple. Take out those seeds, plant them, and you'll see a new tree. From those tree come more apples that have seeds in them that are ready to plant the next apple tree. It's remarkable. Everything else in heaven and earth only exists as a result of the reality of His existence. If one could conceive that He does not exist, then neither could anything else exist. Right? We established that. If God doesn't exist, nothing else exists. If, however, one could conceive that nothing else existed, then he alone would still exist. Right? If there's nothing else in the world, God will still be here. He would not cease to exist when they did, for all things depend on Hashem, but He does not depend on them at all. Therefore, nothing is quite as real as He is. The only thing that's real, that has no beginning, no end, that is always in existence, that's a constant, is God. None of, sadly, none of us are a constant. Children rely on their parents to be their constant throughout their life. They're, that's their reliable, their pillar. But even parents don't live forever. I think it's a very fundamental principle for us to get into the idea of what prayer is. What is prayer? Prayer is understanding that there is a creator who created me, who created everything around me, who loves me, which is why he gave me life to begin with, and wants to do good for me. So, what happens is, God invested so much in us, you think God doesn't want to see us succeed? All we have to do is reach out to God and talk to Him. And ask Him. God cares about us enough to give us life. Certainly He cares about us enough to give us success in life. And to give us the things we need. But we first have to have that emunah. We first have to have that faith to know that there is a God... And that God has no partners. He has all awesome unity, oneness, needs nothing else for his existence, and nothing else but God is one. Nothing else but God is perfect. The prophet therefore said, Jeremiah 10.10, 10, The Lord God is real. Only He is real. Nothing else is real in the sense that He is. Some things can have a good day, but nothing can have a good day forever. Well, God can. 
The Torah likewise says there is nothing else besides him. Nothing else shares his ultimate reality. Deuteronomy 4.35. Right? So we, we see everything again is backed up in the Torah. And just two short things here. The, this, being is, this being is God of the world, Lord of all the earth. His power has neither end nor limit. And the last point is to know this is one to know this is one of the commandments of the Torah. It is thus written, I am the Lord your God your God. Right? And uh, there are many things that we can discuss in this topic. I do recommend, if you have some time, to take a look. We have an incredible book in this library called the Rabbi Arya Kaplan, the Arya Kaplan Anthology. This book, an amazing book. It deals with the Animamin. It deals with principles of faith, the real Messiah, uh, the infinite light, and if you were God. And it's absolutely marvelous, marvelous book. So um, I, I highly uh, encourage you to learn this more, to think about this idea uh, of how do, we, how do we define God? And what do we say that God is, uh, why do we say that God is both creator and ruler? Why, why can't it just be one of them? It's important for us to understand, right? In this uh, prayer that we say every day in the Animamin, it's I believe with perfect faith that God is the creator and ruler of all things. He alone has made, does make, and will make all things. Why does it need to say he's a creator and ruler? Think about that. Because you can create something that just sits there, but then in the ruler you have an active... You have an active role. It's not enough, it's not enough to just create something. You have to be actively involved to the day-to-day -day experience, which is another idea for us to understand. That God is involved in every single one of our activities every single day. Now, we can talk about prayer. We will talk about prayer. But prayer is something which is so much easier than people think. It's something which is so tangible for us to just open up our mouths and talk to Hashem. Hashem is sitting there waiting to hear, to collect our words. To collect our requests. Just like a parent wants to hear their child say, please, can I have a lollipop? Sure you can have a lollipop. All you have to do is ask. And the child tries to grab it. No, 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 no. Let me hear it. Let me hear you say it. Right? God says, oh, you want that job. I know you want that job. One second, one second. Let me hear you say it. Let me hear you pray. Let me hear you beg. Let me hear you cry. It says that our matriarchs were barren. They weren't able to have children. They weren't able to conceive. Why? God says their, their prayers are so precious. I want them to pray to me. I want them to cry to me. I want them to really, I'm going to give them the child. But I want them to seek me. I want that relationship with them. So let's recognize that the existence of Hashem is real. It's one. It's perfect. And let's seek out Hashem. Let's find Hashem in our day-to-day -day lives. The more we look for Hashem, the more Hashem will be visible. The more we try to ignore Hashem, the more He will be invisible. You had a question? Uh, thoughts. Thought. We can pray to God in thoughts. Oh, why not? I'm asking. It's better to say it in words, in actual words, to verbalize it. But if a person can't ver verbalize it for whatever reason, you yeah, you, you look, it, it's not going to be so pleasant if you're standing at the Department of, of Motor Vehicle and you start going on a whole thing of prayer, right? <laughs> they might think uh, some other interesting things about you, right? <laughs> but, right? So, you, you might be escorted out, right? So, my friends, thank you so much. That was principle number one of Emuna of faith, based on the teachings of the Rambam. And I look forward to next week continuing with you. Thank you and have a terrific evening. Thank you to our friends online. Thank you for joining us. And we hope that if you enjoyed this, you will like and share these videos online so other people can learn hopefully and perhaps be inspired and grow in their Judaism. Thank you so much. Have a terrific evening, everybody.